So as you can see, we have a, we've improved our logo from this very fancy hand-drawn logo to this logo. I'm not entirely sure how it was made, but I understand it cost about $5. Um, so very, very fancy, uh, incredibly fancy. Um, so I'm talking about sparkling pandas. How many people, just out of curiosity, know what Spark is? Okay, pretty good. How many people know what pandas is? Awesome, cool. Okay, great. It looks like my assumptions were pretty much straight on, so I'm, I'm really happy. Um, I'd like to, to throw a special shout out to Juliet uh, Hoagland for her amazing work. Um, some of the slides are, are from when we gave this talk together a while back, and she also got our test suite passing again last night at 1 a.m. All of the tests passed, so I think I'm really stoked about that. Um, and and so thanks to Juliet, she's not here today, but you know, super happy fun times. So my name is Holden. My preferred pronouns are she or her. Uh, I'm a co-author of the Learning Spark book. Um, there's actually going to be a book signing right after this at the O'Reilly thing, and I think there's 25 free copies is what they told me. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Spark, you know, you can come do that and we can chat about Spark. Uh, I'm an engineer at Alpine Data Labs. I've been at a bunch of places before that, always sort of doing big data e machine learning or sort of recommendation type problems. Um, once upon a time, way, way back when, I was a PM intern at Microsoft, and that did not go well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's good. Now I'm back as an engineer and things. Well, I mean, I'm at Alpine as an engineer. Anyways, being an engineer, much better fit for me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Holden Caro. If you don't have enough cat pictures in your life or complaints about American health care, uh, follow me on Twitter. You know, you, you can watch a Canadian try and understand what's going on down here. Um, the slides from today's talk and the workshop that I gave yesterday are both going to be on my slide share. Uh, so if you do want to take a picture of one slide, this is probably the slide to take a picture of, so you can find the rest of the slides later on. Um, if you're all like professional and stuff and you don't like cat pictures or like you just want to talk to me about more than cat pictures, you can add me on LinkedIn for business business numbers. Um, like, let me know like you were in my talk because there's, there's a lot of you and I won't recognize your face. But you know, add me on LinkedIn if you want to talk professional. So it seems like almost everyone knows what Pandas is, so we're just going to go super fast. Today we're focusing on Pandas data frames. Um, and there, there are these really awesome tabular data structures, and they make it really easy to slice and dice data. If you don't know what Pandas is, check out pandas.pydata.org. And, and pandas is the next best thing since sliced bread. I think it's awesome. I also think Spark is awesome. And I wanted to put these two awesome things together. Um, so even though most people know what Spark is, just for the few people that don't, it's this really awesome distributed computing system that's a lot faster than MapReduce, which is maybe not the highest bar to jump over in the world, but it's pretty important because that's sort of the pre-existing standard. Um, it also has a really, really nice API uh, compared to MapReduce, where you only really have these two types of operations. We get a much richer uh, set of operations we can do. So Spark is, is sort of split up into all of these different pieces, um, although it does ship together as a unit. Um, today we're going to be focusing on sort of core Apache Spark and also Spark SQL and the data frame component that ships with Spark called Spark Data Frames. Um, there are things like streaming, uh, graph tools, although I haven't used the graph tools, um, but essentially there's all of the sort of distributed computing type things that you would normally do with separate projects together in a single project, which makes it a lot easier to integrate the tools together. Um, and I think that's pretty cool because I don't like maintaining multiple services. Uh, if I can put it all together, I'm happy. Uh, and Spark makes it pretty easy. Um, there's also some benefits from this from sort of a development point of view. Uh, in terms of core Apache Spark, gets a lot of improvements happening to it because like, streaming needed faster task launching. And then this faster task launching improves the SQL queries as well. So like, there's this cross-benefit thing with having this common platform. So we're going to be talking about doing some stuff on top of Spark. So I'm going to have to use some Spark-specific terms. Or I'm going to. Maybe don't have to, but I want to. Um, there's the Spark context. 
And the Spark context is sort of like our window into the world of Spark. Uh, we can think of it as just like a connection to our cluster. Uh, it's a bit more than that. Um, but it's, it's where we're going to ask Spark to load data. Uh, we could create accumulators and things like that on the Spark context as well. There's also the SQL context. Um, and the SQL context is built on top of the Spark context. And it gives us this window into all of the SQL and sort of structured data views of Spark. Uh, a transformation is something which takes one of Spark's distributed collections, which are called RDDs, or a data frame, and gives us back another RDD or data frame. Um, transformations are lazily evaluated. Uh, that just means that when we do a transformation, the work doesn't happen right away. Um, it happens later once we do the something that requires that work. Uh, so an example would be counting the elements or, or saving it. Um, and those things are actions. So you might be wondering why you're in this talk if Spark already has data frames, right? Um, you know, why not just use the Spark data frames? And, and Spark's data frames are really cool. But I think the sort of painful part about Spark's data frames is they're not what we've come to expect uh, from data frames, right? If we're coming from Pandas or R, the data frame API just really isn't that rich. Um, we can do really simple filtering. We can write SQL queries against stuff. And, and if we want to write a bunch of SQL queries against our data frames, that's great. But if we want to start to do sort of more complex type operations that we would do in Pandas, the API just isn't there. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing or they should have this really broad API. Uh, it's just a design choice that they've made. And you know, I clearly made a different one. Um, they're both really fast. Um, one of the things that I really feel is missing in Spark data frames, personally, is index support. So there's no real index data in Spark data frames, which is kind of frustrating, um, especially if you're used to working with index data frames. And there's also no visualizations. Um, so today, we're going to look at sort of adding some indexes and adding a really kind of hokey visualization. But it'll give you an idea of how to add more. So this panda inside of a panda image is actually left over from like the first version of the talk, but it was too cute for me to take out. Um, and, and just a bit of history, uh, Sparkling Pandas had a very early version which we made where what we did is we created these distributed collections. And inside of each partition on a distributed collection, we would store a single pandas data frame. And then we would distribute our work on these distributed collections. And we had stuff to support group by and, and all of that stuff. Um, that works pretty well in terms of like it's pretty easy to implement. But it turns out to be kind of slow for some very PySpark specific reasons. Um, and then Spark data frames came along. And Spark data frames made it possible to do things much faster, albeit with a bit more work on our part. And I overcame my natural inclinations to not do work. Um, and, and we worked on making a faster one. So let's, let's start looking at what Spark SQL gives us, right? Um, this is just regular Spark SQL. So this thing is deceptively simple. Um, it's, really, it's really awesome that we're able to call JSON file on an arbitrary file and actually get a structured view out of it. How many people work with JSON data here? OK, how many of you have had trouble with your JSON data not necessarily conforming to what you thought the schema was? OK, that's like, I think, at least 80% of the people there. Um, so th this is pretty awesome, right? Spark is actually able to go take this JSON file and do schema inference automatically for us. Um, so to be honest, like there are times when I've just used Spark SQL just to figure out what the hell's going on with my JSON data. I point it at like a year's worth of like logs and, and run it. Um, but anyways, uh, so you know we we can load some data, we can register it as a SQL table, and we can write queries against it. That's that's cool, you know it's it's not bad. Um, but you know maybe we want to do a little more. So. You know, maybe we want to bring it back to a pandas data frame afterwards. Uh, so we import our pandas. We, we do a similar thing. We load some data from HDFS. We filter it down to something that's small enough to fit on a single machine. And then we call two pandas on it. And this gives us back a local pandas data frame to work with. Um, what's really cool is like this is actually just in Spark, regular Spark. This isn't sparkling pandas. Um, and I think, to be honest, for a lot of people, this is a pretty good fit. 
uh, for what you're going to want to do. Like, pretty often we have these really, really huge data sets, and we only care about this tiny sliver. Um, and, and Spark SQL makes it really easy to do that and bring it back to a pandas data frame. But sometimes, you know, we need to do more than just the simple filter before we can bring it down to a single machine to do sort of more complex analysis. Oh, yeah, um, we can also take a local data frame and make it distributed. That's useful mostly for joining data. It's, it's not, if your data fits on a single machine anyways, you probably don't bother distributing it unless you need to do a join. But so we're going we're gonna to go beyond just this simple filter mechanism, and we're going to combine our, our really fast distributed system, Spark, with our really awesome, happy API, Pandas. Um, it's going to be like peanut butter and jelly, as you can see, there's the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, so, you know, we're going to try and add more functionality to data frames. The natural way to start doing this is to look where Spark wants you to extend data frames. Um, there's a few places where we can do this. Uh, the simplest thing is we can add UDFs. Who's written a Hive UDF? Okay, only a few people. Never mind then. Um, Writing Spark SQL UDFs is actually pretty simple, and, and I'll show one in a little bit. Um, User-defined aggregates in Spark SQL is actually kind of frustrating to do. Uh, the API is getting a lot better, though, um, so that's, that's a thing we can do. Another option, and this is the option that appeals to my inner laziness, is we can use bits of pandas code. So we could actually write our UDFs and have them call pandas code for us. Um, and, and a third option is Spark packages. Um, there's this wonderful community site of all sorts of Spark libraries. Uh, you've got things like reading in from CSV or Avro or stuff like that uh, on top of like different machine learning algorithms and stuff. So we can, we can extend Spark SQL in that way. Um, and that way is really awesome because it, it's not all that much work, right? We just install this extra package and we get this additional functionality. So how do we make our peanut butter and jelly sandwich? That's really the question. Um, we've got this, this Sparkling Pandas API. And our goal for the Sparkling Pandas API is to be as close to Pandas compatible as is reasonable, given that I'm lazy. Um, so our Sparkling Pandas API needs to store some little extra bits of internal state that just don't show up uh, in Spark data frames. But most of our calls, it'll look at this internal state and translate them into calls on Spark data frames. Um, we'll have to add some UDFs because, for example, there's no built-in median function, and computing the median is kind of a useful thing. Um, so we'll add some UDFs. For some of the UDFs, we'll just write some Scala code. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Python conference people, but you know we'll, we'll write some Scala code because that's sort of where Spark is mostly, and we can get a better performance by extending in the JVM. Um, for other things where it would be a lot of work to write the Scala code, we'll just go ahead and call some pandas stuff. For other things, we'll take our data frames and we'll convert them into sort of these RDDs of, of pandas data frames and do our operations that way. Um, it's a little slower, but you know, the, it makes it much easier to implement certain types of operations. So some of the group by stuff is done this way, even though it's slow, it was just a lot faster to implement. And we'll fix it if people actually want to use it uh, a lot. And that's how we make our peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So let's go and start, start making some of that sandwich together. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to add index names to pandas data frames. Oh, sorry, yeah, Spark data frames. Um, it's, it's actually pretty simple. We're just going to have to keep track of our index names. And when we bring the data back, we can still use this two pandas thing. We just need to update the index names. And update the index names just involves translating the Spark, uh, sorry, the index names into these Spark columns and vice versa. So for example, since we can have unnamed index names, we'll have these like special reserve fields in the, pan, in the Spark data frame. And when we bring it back, we'll do some like sketchy conversion stuff behind the scenes. It's pretty simple. We can also like start adding UDFs. Um, this UDF, you know, is not actually one of the UDFs in Sparkling Pandas because string length is is pretty simple. Um, but the other ones don't really fit super nicely on the slide because they're a bit more complex. But you can see how adding UDFs to Spark SQL is really simple, right? 
Uh, we give it a function name, we provide a function, and we specify our return type. Um, and, and this is where we start extending stuff with Scala. And, and I'm sorry. Um, I actually am very sorry, because there's something called evil SQL on there. And in case you can't guess, evil SQL tools is not an official part of Spark. Um, evil SQL tools is, because we are doing things with the internals of Spark SQL to try and do some of these extensions, sometimes developers don't like it when you are doing that, and you have to lie about who you are. Uh, so evil SQL tools pretends to be in the Spark package and lets us get access to these column expressions so we can write our own things that are going to extend it. Um, so that's pretty simple. I mean, the actual Kurtosis implementation, like we can call Apache Math Commons, and, and there's a really good implementation there. Um, calling it from the Python side is a little bit funky, um, but really the, the main thing, and you, you don't have to understand this code too much if you don't want to, uh, is that PySpark is implemented using something called Py4j. Has anyone used Py4j? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, um, so Py4j is a really simple bridge between Python and the JVM. Um, and it lets us send sort of like, we tell the JVM what we want it to do, and then it'll send us back some results. And this is pretty useful because it lets us do these sorts of things where we're calling JVM functions. Um, and so this just you know makes a column that's actually a JVM function under the hood. Um, so, you know, we can, in addition to just adding UDFs, we can write things that are going to wrap the data frame. Um, so, so far what we've done mostly has involved extending a data frame, um, but at the end of the day, right, we need to expose a different API to the user. There's no plot function on uh, Spark data frame. So what we do is we have a, a class which is wrapping the Spark data frame and exposing the Python API um, that's similar-ish to, to the Pandas API. Um, and so this is just a plot. It's really simple. Um, and I think there's actually a lot of really cool opportunities to make visualizations work well in Sparkling Pandas. Uh, this one's especially easy because it's just a bar chart. So a lot of things we can do, though, by doing some sort of aggregates, right, like a box and whiskers plot, we can do that by doing computing these aggregates on our data set, and we only have to return these summary statistics. Um, and that actually makes it possible to do the plot without having to do any fancy, like, passing SVGs around between machines, which would, you know, be not a lot of fun. Um, so this, this is a really simple plot. Uh, it's the like pronouns of the speakers here. Uh, or it, it was, it was from a few weeks ago, but yeah. And it's, it's not merged into master just yet uh, because of the refactoring and fixing of all the tests. Uh, this one needs to be rebased. Um, but if anyone wants to implement some graphs on top of Sparkling Pandas, I would be super happy um, and, and you should come talk to me, and we can talk about like what sort of steps would be involved. And if you just want to write the Python side, I could do the Scala side, or vice versa, whatever. More contributors always welcome, please. So I've hinted at some of the things on this slide uh, a bit so far, right? What makes Sparkling Pandas fast? Now, admittedly, it's for a really, really flexible definition of the word fast. At the end of the day, Sparkling Pandas is slower than regular Spark data frames because we're keeping track of extra bits of information. And we're also doing some things which Spark avoided doing because they're kind of slow, um, but we wanted to do so that we could expose a more friendly API. Um, so if your stuff maps really well to just pure Spark data frames, it might be a better fit for you. Um, but yeah, so here's some of the things that we do to, to try and make things really fast. Um, we keep data in the JVM for as long as possible. I mentioned that PySpark was implemented using Py4j, um, and part of that means that when we're doing sort of operations in PySpark, we end up having to serialize and deserialize a lot of data repeatedly, and it turns out uh, for a lot of distributed computing stuff, your serialization cost is actually a significant percentage of your time. Um, Kay had a really interesting talk on that um, at uh, Spark Summit West uh, 2015 on, on sort of the things which make distributed jobs slow. 
Um, another thing that we do is we're distributed. So for some cases, we can be faster than processing on a local machine. Um, that's normally when your data is actually too big to fit on your local machine. If your data is measured in kilobytes, um, don't use sparkling pandas. It's, it's gonna, I mean, it'll probably work, but it's not really intended for that. It's intended for like when you have too much data and you really need a distributed system. The other one is, is lazy operations. Um, and we sort of cheat on lazy operations, but I feel less bad about this because at the end of the day, so does PySpark, uh, sorry, so does Spark data frames. Um, essentially, we need to keep track of some extra schema information. And sometimes the only way to figure out what's happening with your data is to evaluate some of it and see what the schema transformation is because we can't introspect your functions super well. Um, so sometimes we'll evaluate like chunks of your data, uh, but we use laziness as much as possible. So we only evaluate a tiny slice of your data to do schema inference on. Um, and the rest of the stuff is still able to benefit from Spark's pipelining. Um, the final way in which we're incredibly fast is I drink a lot of coffee. I'm actually double fisting coffee today. Um, and, and you can be as energetic as I am, even if you wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, if you drink two cups of coffee. Sorry. <laughs> so in our goal to try and support uh, the, the Pandas API, we, we have a bunch of supported operations. Most of them are pretty basic. Um, but this just sort of gives you an idea of the kinds of simple operations uh, that we've implemented. There's a, there's a bunch more as of like about 1 a.m., but I was asleep, so I didn't have a chance to update the slide with the things that got, that got merged in. Um, but you can go and check out our website for, for more information. So as I've been trying to trick, uh, convince all of you um, to contribute to Sparkling Pandas, uh, this wonderful graph shows that you are all super convinced and in this hypothetical wonderful future, you're all joining us and you're, you're helping us write the amazing interface that is Sparkling Pandas. Um, so we've done a bunch of work. Admittedly, the work done graph really hasn't changed a whole lot since the last time we gave the talk, but that's more out of laziness with graphs. Um, I like to think we've, we've actually progressed a little bit more than the graph shows. Uh, to be fair, our, our hypothetical wonderful future is maybe somewhat optimistic, but there's a lot of people in the room, and you know, I, I hope you all, or at least you know, half of you, 10%, whatever, some of you come and join us at, at making Sparkling Pandas awesome. Um, so there's a bunch of other things, right? You, you might not want to use Sparkling Pandas, and I won't hold it against you if you go and use Blaze. Um, Blaze is a really cool project from Continuum, which gives you some data frame-like operations, and it can, runs on a bunch of different backends, including Spark. Um, so Blaze is pretty rad. There is a Ada Tau's distributed data frame. I hope I got their name right. Uh, and it's actually been released, I believe, now. Um, and there's also Numba, which I haven't played with, but it's, it's another option. And to be fair, like, if you search for distributed data frame on Google, like, you're going to get a bunch of options. Um, any of them could be better than Sparkling Pandas. Honestly, I think Sparkling Pandas is pretty cool, but I am the one wearing a panda dress. So take it with a grain of salt. So if you do want to actually try out Sparkling Pandas, and, and I think that would be awesome, uh, we have a website, very fancy, .com, cost nearly $10. Um, you can check us out at sparklingpandas.com. Uh, our code's all on GitHub, uh, so github.com slash sparklingpandas. Uh, we have a mailing list. It's not super active because despite my optimism with convincing people to join the project, our last talk didn't really join our committer base uh, outside of people I knew in San Francisco. Uh, so mostly I just hang out with Juliet and we write the code together. But if, if anyone wants to like use the mailing list, that would be rad and we'll totally try and answer your questions on the mailing list. So most people probably know where to get pandas from, um, pandas.pydata.org. If you don't have Spark, getting Spark set up can be a bit trickier. Um, so spark.apache.org, it can't be pip installed uh, right now. Um, it just has some 
a lot of Java dependencies, really. Um, but spark.apache.org, if you are, how many people have an in-house cluster? Okay, cool. How many people run their stuff on like AWS? Okay, right. So, so for the people that either have an in-house cluster or are running their stuff on AWS, uh, many of the vendors like Cloudera and, and stuff like that ship a version of Spark with their more recent distributions so you can upgrade your version. Um, and if you're running your stuff on AWS, there's, uh, there's some stuff in EMR to automatically launch a Spark cluster. And there's also some scripts uh, in a directory called Spark AC2 to just spin up a Spark cluster. And I think it's a really great way to start experimenting with both Spark and Sparkling Pandas. Uh, cool. So I have a really cute red panda who is eating. Um, does anyone have any like questions about Sparkling Pandas, Spark? I also have buttons with our very fancy new logo. These buttons are, I think they cost about $10 to make all of the buttons and they're free today to you. Um, <laughs> And if you ask a question, I'll even run up and give you a button if anyone wants to ask a question. Can I have a button? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Who said that? I can hand them up for you if you want. Cool. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you. Does anyone have non-button related questions? Um, we now have a, a button expert handling the button distribution and questions. Uh, okay, no, no non-button related questions. Oh, no, over here. oh. Got two questions. cool. Uh, sorry, yeah? Okay, um, I saw the acronym RDD a lot. I didn't catch what that was. Sure, okay, yeah, sorry about that. So RDD is how Spark represents its distributed data. Uh, it's called a resilient distributed data set. Um, RDDs are really awesome and, and okay, uh, I'm jumping up and down a little bit. Um, but so RDDs are, are these things which are resilient. So that means if a node fails, it's okay. You're not gonna lose your data. Uh, they're distributed, so they're on many machines and it contains data. Um, but like the resiliency is actually achieved in kind of a neat way. Um, what happens with Spark is when you're applying these transformations, uh, not only is it like delaying the evaluation by constructing this graph of all of the operations that you're doing, it's actually keeping that graph of operations around in case one of the nodes failed that had some of data that you'd cached on it um, from your computation, and then it'll use this graph to recompute the missing data. This is pretty awesome because, you know, Recomputing just a small subset of your data tends to be faster than writing everything to disk three times after each single operation, which some other systems have to do. Um, does that, awesome. Was there a second question that was not button related? Oh, cool. Do you wanna just shout it out? I can't really see very well the lights. Okay, sure. So um, just to repeat the question to make sure I, I got it. Uh, so the question is, when you use Sparkling Pandas, does it distribute the work on multiple nodes? Is that the question? Yeah. Cool, awesome. Yeah, it totally does. Um, RDDs are automatically distributed on different nodes, and so are data frames. Uh, so since Sparkling Pandas uses RDDs and data frames, uh, the data and the work is automatically distributed on different nodes across your cluster. Um, you can sort of fine tune things a little more specifically if you like care about the number of like workers and partitions and stuff like that. Uh, but it's, it's done automatically if you don't specify anything. Cool, that's a great question. So the question was, uh, which parts of the, or how did we decide which parts of the, Python, of the Pandas API we implemented first and which parts we wanted to save for later? Um, so there were two things. Uh, 
The first thing was I looked at the Pandas API and I said to myself, Holden, what is going to be easy to implement? Um, and honestly, that's where a lot of the stuff started from. Uh, but we also like needed to do something actually useful to people. So we needed to balance doing things that looked like we were making progress with things which someone could actually use. Um, and that's why we implemented group by, right? Because like all of these single operations on a regular data frame are really easy to implement when you're not having to do any sort of grouping or sorting logic. Um, because distributed systems are really easy to work one record at a time. But we wanted to make something that someone would want to use. Uh, so we decided we'd implement at least one hard thing um, that someone would probably care about. And we figured grouping was probably like a good place to start. Um, we might do some funky join operations if that's stuff people care about. Um, if there's operations that you really want to see Sparkling Pandas implement, uh, you can either reach out to me on Twitter or, you know, oh dear, don't want to lose our cute panda picture. Um, or or you, can, you can message the mailing list. And, or, or you could even create a GitHub issue, and I would be super happy. Um, more questions? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, who's using Sparkling Pandas and if companies are, are using it? Um, to the best of my knowledge, no one's using it in production um, yet. They, they probably really shouldn't until about 1 a.m. Uh, from last night. Uh, we've had a bunch of people from different places get in touch with us, and we've mostly told them to, like, please wait. We, we want to get some changes in. Um, so probably our, our next release, we'll email those people back and let them know that it's, like, it's a good time to start using it. And we'll probably do a release in the next few days. Um, so actually, yeah, it, that's, that's a good point. Um, probably don't pip install Sparkling Pandas today. Um, wait for our next release. But if you want to go and look at the code, like now's a great time to go and look at the code. But maybe not a good time to install the, the release package. Cool. I think you were next. Cool. Sure. So the, the question is essentially what we're doing around serialization uh, with the follow-up that you switched from using Cairo to Java native serialization, and you saw an improvement, nothing, or uh, you saw a great improvement. OK, that's really interesting. Um, by default, we, we use the default serializer. Um, so this actually means we, we use different serializers for different things, which is kind of funky. Um, for when we're working with RDDs, uh, we're going to be using, so when we're working with RDDs of Pandas data frames, uh, on the Python side, we're using Cloud Pickle. And in the Java side, it's using just the regular Java serializer um, for like these, these arrays that it's getting past. Um, when we're doing stuff with data frames, we actually use the, the Cairo serializer um, because with the structured data, uh, the Cairo serializer tends to be a lot better than the regular Java serializer. Um, so I would, I, I would really like to chat with you afterwards maybe about what your experience was with switching the two. Cool. Um, and you, you had a question too. Yeah, it's probably going to explode. Don't, don't. Okay, sorry, so I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, the question is, there's a lot of libraries that take in pandas data frames. Are there any concerns with passing one of those libraries a, a sparkling pandas data frame? Um, and the answer is, it's not going to work. Um, uh, fundamentally, we're, we're trying to be as close as possible to the API. Um, but right now, today, it, it's just going to explode. Um, if there's a specific library or, or function in the library that you're interested in seeing work with it, um, I'd love to talk. And we can look at what would be involved in making that work. 
OK, cool. Yeah, uh, essentially, because it's a distributed system, we still have this explicit mechanism for like when you need to bring the data back to the single machine. Um, and like uh, the libraries aren't going to understand that like certain operations they'll have to do this thing to actually poke at the elements. Um, but certain libraries might actually work, uh, provided that they just write purely regular transformations against the data frame. And it, it's kind of a crap shot. Uh, but I'll try and make it more awesome. Um, oh, and I'm about to get kicked off. But if anyone brought their ham radio to um, the conference, I'm Kilo Kilo 6 Juliet Kilo Quebec. Uh, I want an excuse to use my ham radio. OK, sorry. Completely unrelated.